precious Jesus. Lord, I ask your blessing on the word this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint my mind with clarity, my mouth with precision, and our ears with good hearing. I ask, Lord, that you would work in our hearts through this message, and that you would affect everybody that you want affected with this message. And Lord, I just pray also for the, the uh, clarity of the heartbeat, having received this, Lord, in such a quick manner last night, and trying to reconstruct it, Lord, under your anointing. I just pray, Lord, that you would fill in the gaps of anything that I missed, Lord, as I was putting it together. We bless your name. Amen. Amen. The title of this message is Covered. Covered. This message came to me last night in, in, in an odd way. And I'm only saying it in an odd way because the things and the concepts that I sometimes, um, excuse me, <coughs> thanks. The things and the concepts that I sometimes hear in my heart or see in my head are based on dim reflections of other things. And it's kind of like the word association game, where you say a word and it brings up another word, and then that person hears that word and it brings up another word. And within a few microseconds, you've gone from what you started with, the word that you started with, to something totally different that um, you could end up talking about, simply because your mind bounces like a rock on the water, skips across the water, and gets to a destination that you didn't expect. Well, you'll notice later on in this message, you'll probably catch the clue as to where the, the thought struck, where the little pebble dropped into the water to start the whole thing. But uh, you'll laugh at me when you see it, and I won't blame you for laughing at me. But at the same time, make sure you get the point. Because this is a significant spiritual point cloaked in what is already known. And yet there's a lot more deeper to it that I think is there in pertaining to God and Christ and us and man. And, and so the message is just going to be about this truth. But hidden within that will be things you should um, derive conclusions from also. Take it further than what I might say this morning, thinking about it. The title of this message is called Covered. The reason it's called Covered is because it's talking about covering, clothing, clothing. It's such a simple thing, really, when we stop to consider clothing. We wear it every day. We wouldn't dare think of not wearing it. <laughs> we pretty well ignore it in some regards, you know, except for the fashion conscious and the, and the image conscious. We just take it for granted. Wearing clothing is what we do. And every nation and every race has their own unique clothing. And every uh, gender has their unique clothing. And the marketers of this world have invented all kinds of clothing. And uh, we just kind of take it for granted in some regards. And then we come into spiritual business, and we read verses that talk about being covered, and we go, uh-huh, I get it. But every now and then, something really obvious starts becoming really potent when applied or understood in spiritual business. And that is the case with this message. It's going to be obvious, but the impact of what's obvious is where we're going. You need to take it out of just your head and hearing what I say and put it down into your heart in realizing the spiritual implications, uh, the spiritual ripple, as it were, the spiritual effect that this topic has on everything. Once you do, you might just find yourself used to God a little bit more. Or maybe you'll use God a little bit more. Or maybe you'll see. The first thing I want to talk about, the first section of, of, of the topic of, of clothing, is the priest. 
In the Old Testament, the priest had his robes. The priest, the sons of Aaron, Aaron and his sons, set apart, set aside to a purpose. Wouldn't that have been enough just to set them apart to their purpose? Wouldn't that have been enough for God to say, these are the guys, and everybody should recognize that, right? But when God wrote his law, what he did was real interesting. He said, now, I'm going to tell you what your job is, but I want you to put clothing on that demonstrates what your job is. And I'm going to be very specific on what I'm going to allow you to wear and not allow you to wear. And you're going to wear that. I want to read you the verses that tie or deal with the subject of the priest putting on his robes. And in, a, in, the, in themselves, they're not grand. But the kick of it is real interesting to me. Leviticus 6.10 And the priest shall put on his linen garment... And his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh. And take up the ashes which the fire has consumed with the burnt offerings on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. You go put on your linen breeches and your linen garment, and then you can go touch holy ashes. Ashes of a sacrifice. Ashes? Ashes. Ashes are dust. Ashes are dead, decay, dead things. <laughs> Why do you need special clothing to go pick up dead ashes? <laughs> They're not asbestos garments. They're not fireproof garments. They're not special garments. They're priest garments. So what would happen if somebody who wasn't wearing a priest garment decided to pick up the ashes? You know, just hire a local ashes picker-upper. Somehow I have the feeling the fire wouldn't have gone out. So I have the feeling that the non-priest picking up the ashes would have been like the non-priest entering into the tabernacle with strange fire. Or the non-priest entering in the tabernacle even with real fire. <laughs> Why would God even care? What does God care about clothing? God doesn't care about clothing. Why should he? But this is the Old Testament, admittedly. So we'll talk Old Testament for now. <coughs> Leviticus 6.11 says, And he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. Gonna now change your garments again. You're going to take off your garments and put on other garments. I don't want those garments on. I want these garments on. Leviticus 16.4 he shall put on the holy linen coat. <laughs> and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with a linen miter shall it be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. I don't want him putting these holy garments on until he has washed himself either. I want this flesh man washed and covered by a holy linen coat, by a holy linen breeches, by a holy linen something, something I want sanctified, set apart, because that will then set you apart, O oh priest. You have to realize that the sons of Aaron were just freshly delivered Israelites right out of Egypt by just a few short months. These weren't guys who had spent 25 years being anointed for the priesthood. These weren't guys who had been trained in the best theological schools of Egypt. They were just like the disciples, a bunch of rookies with two words from God. You're now my priest. And here's how you'll dress. God has a dress code. Ah, oh, typical employer. God has a dress code so that the people will know who's a priest, who's not a priest. Now, could this be a type of the church today? Are there those wearing 
priest robes and those who are not wearing priest robes? Are we not all Israel? Are we not all sons of God? Are we not all anointed ones? Are we not all Christians? Are we not all the same? Well, you tell me. You tell me what kind of cloak, covering, miter, girdle, garment you're wearing. It's not a flesh girdle. It's a linen girdle. I mean, you even have to realize what cloth it's made out of. You have to realize what substance it's made out of. Even that's not permitted to be different than what I tell you. Yet we believe in Christianity and in our religion that we can add and subtract anything we want to it. Just as long as it communicates, right? Leviticus 16.23 And Aaron shall come unto the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place, and he shall leave them there. No, you don't get to take them home with you. <laughs> because the Aaron that is Aaron is different than the Aaron who is not Aaron. Aaron is a man. Aaron the priest is somebody else. Aaron is humanity, ordinary, descendant of Adam, descendant of a particular tree of, of genealogy. But Aaron, when he's wearing the garments, is not Aaron anymore. Do you remember when Moses was standing up and Aaron and Miriam decided to say, uh-uh, we're like you? I could almost hear Moses saying, really, got a cloud following you everywhere you go? I do. Well, we're just like you. Uh-huh. We're prophets. We get visions. We get dreams. We get anointings. We get... We get... We're just like you, Moses. Really. Do you wear a cloud? I wear a cloud. When I go into the tabernacle, the tent, my tent, the cloud comes down upon my tent and covers me. Does the cloud come down upon your tent and cover you? See, it's important when you ask yourself the question, what's covering what? Humanity, Aaron, descendant and friend of Moses, right-hand man, mouthpiece of Moses, he shall be as your prophet and you shall be as his God, God said of Aaron. And yet Aaron has to wear certain clothes, and when he's done doing the bigger than Aaron things, or greater than Aaron things, catch my terms, you'll realize that he then turned around and took it back off again and left it on the altar. And so it was, and so it is even with Christ. Three and a half years, Christ the anointed. And then he took it off and hung on a cross Christ, the man. Keep these crossovers in your mind. You'll see them. They're there. You'll realize, wait a second, something's going on here that's much deeper than the picture. I couldn't even crystallize some of what I got last night on paper. I've got it at the bottom of the sermon as part two, question mark. So some of it's going to come back up into this message here as I'm talking. He left his garments behind and went off to be Aaron. Leviticus 16.24 And he shall wash his flesh with the water in the holy place. Now you don't even get to wash your garments just any old place. They can only be washed in the holy place. And put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. No make atonement till clothing right. <laughs> and make sure it's washed in the right place, according to the pattern, according to the design. Don't try to wash yourself with your own water. It's not going to work. We are washed by the water of the Word, and nothing else. And our garments, spotted, wrinkled, or dotted, can only be ironed and made white, when dipped into the fuller bright, fuller soap, 
book of Isaiah uses that term. White like it's been washed by soap. When we stop to consider that the atonement for the people could not be made until he was in the right position, the right clothing, covered correctly, God was not going to honor that request for atonement unless his priest was in the right spirit. How many things do we try to do in prayer on behalf of others and we don't step into our garments before we get there? A clue to the rest of the message. Leviticus 16.32 And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen cloths, even the holy garments. So now we have a priest who's got to pass on his duties. And he has to do two things. He has to anoint the next guy, and he's got to give him the clothes. Now anointing, there's something that struck me last night real hard. Anointing is just a different kind of covering. Mm -hmm. Anointing is when they take a bottle of oil and they pour it on your head and it drips down your face and it covers your body. And it's a symbolic representation of an invisible activity. But you have just put on anointing. You have been anointed. You have been covered. God apparently makes decisions predicated on your covering. Ever heard somebody say, what's your covering or who's your covering? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm giving you your answer. I'm telling you what you're covered with if you are accepting the spiritual function of a priest. Thou hast made us kings and priests. The priest whom he shall anoint. He must be a priest, he must be anointed, and he shall be consecrated, and he shall put on the linen clothes, and then he shall make atonement. Kind of sounds like a combination lock. One left, two right, three left, four right, open door. What if I decide to skip the last step? I'll do the uh, anoint part, and uh, I think I'll skip the clothing part, and I'll uh, go ahead and minister the atonement to the people because I'm a priest. What happens? Nothing works. I don't understand why God's not answering. I don't see why, why God isn't replying, saith the priest. We asked for atonement for the people, and, and God didn't give us no atonement. Big bad God. <laughs> Whoops, careful. Leviticus 21.10 He that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. You are not permitted to uncover your head while you're in this robe. And you're not allowed to tear the robe. You're not allowed to rend your clothes. And we'll talk a little bit, a little bit here down the road about rending clothes because it also is an act of dealing with your covering. And God very specifically says, I don't want to see that robe rended. When you wear it, you wear it for purpose. Excuse me. And I don't want it used for any other purpose. Ezekiel says, When the priests enter therein, then shall they not go out of the holy place into the utter court, but there they shall lay their garments wherein they minister. For they are holy, and shall put on other garments and shall approach to those things which are for the people. This is the book of Ezekiel now. This is talking about the future temple, which isn't even built yet. This is post-New Testament. Ezekiel's temple will be the temple that's built in Israel during the Israel rule of the world. And yet God's still talking about clothing. Is it ritual? Is it because we need ritual? Or is it because God is the master of audiovisual communication to his kids? 
He is demonstrating. Clothing means something. It's not just clothing when you're using it in certain functions. He shall lay the garments here, and he shall minister with the garments there, and then he'll put off the garments here, and then he'll go off and be and do a be afar, whatever he is, a, you know, a, 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 a counselor or whatever. But then when it's time to do atonement, he's going to put on the garments again. Ezekiel 44, 19. When they go forth into the other court, even into the other court to the people, they shall put off the garments wherein they minister and lay them in holy chambers. In holy chambers. we got anointed rooms for anointed garments from anointed priests who minister under an anointing that was put upon them before they put on the anointed garment. <laughs> Sounds like layers of anointing to me. Sounds like layers of relationship to me. Sure seems like a lot of work for that, that all you need to do is accept the name of Jesus Christ, be born again, and be done with it. Don't you think? Why do you want to bring people into all that stuff? <laughs> How do you teach people about spiritual truths, saith God, unless I show it to them in human ways? An invisible God runs an invisible universe, so he creates a visible universe to explain the invisible universe... And he clothes the universe. Times and seasons. Stars for guiding ships. Mm -hmm. Could have left us in the dark. <laughs> Could have said, I created you, now figure it out. <laughs> All by your little lonesome. No, instead he says, here's what I want to demonstrate. I want to demonstrate to you. You know, I was thinking about this. Maybe I will put it in here. You're thinking about the priests, and you're thinking about the, the uh, a Day of Atonement, and you think about all that they had to go through. They went into the tabernacle. They went into the tabernacle, and there was the mercy seat. And the mercy seat covered something. Covered the law. But there was something that covered the mercy seat. The cherubim. But then it dawned on me there was something that covered the mercy, the cherubim mercy seat combination when the priest was there, the Shekinah glory. And then it dawned on me that that was covered by something. The angels all over the curtains that were embroidered inside the curtains that could only be seen, because it was pitch black in there, could only be seen if the Shekinah showed up. And those curtains were actually part of a, of a larger tabernacle, which was covered yet again. So that the people outside were outside, and the one guy inside was inside. Now, all of Israel is outside. But there are those who know how to go inside. There is something to be said here for realizing that Christ stepped into that seat and is now seated in heavenly places. We are covered and covered and covered. We are anointed under an anointing, under a covering, under an anointing. It dawned on me that that tabernacle, when God dealt with that tabernacle, with that priest, he was saying, I'm dealing with my people. In the same way as when he spoke to Moses on his tent and covered his tent with a cloud and said, now I'm talking to Moses. Now I'm dealing with you. When God decides to anoint, when God decides to cover something, he is demonstrating himself. But he's also demonstrating your change. An ordinary tent now becomes not an ordinary tent. Ordinary, ordinary curtains with ordinary rings with special embroidering on them now become not an ordinary veil anymore. It becomes a significant veil. Because the God who set the patterns, the God who set the stage said, here is what you shall show by your covering. Moving on. The prophets in the Old Testament 
also had a covering. It was called their mantle. That mantle, everybody wore mantles. Go read some of your other Old Testament passages. You find out travelers wore mantles. Regular people wear cloaks. Yeah, but there's something different when a prophet decides to wear a cloak. <laughs> there's something different that happens. 1 Samuel 28:14 says, He said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stopped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. It's just the prophet. He's just like us. He's just a member of Israel like us. I'm king. What are you doing kneeling, king? Yeah. <laughs> just a prophet. You know, just a guy with a little bit of anointing more than what you have. Saul, at one point in his life, was smart enough to kneel. At another point in his life, decided to ignore. He received his cursings and his blessings according to his response to the covering. The mantle. The mantle was the man, and the man was the mantle. But then there came a time when the mantle needed to move on. And in the same manner that the priest had to anoint a priest and take the linen clothes and give him the linen clothes, guess what the prophet had to do? He had to take the mantle and give it to the next guy. How come that mantle, that cloak, couldn't just be put back into ordinary use? For the same reason that the vessels of the temple and the vessels of the tabernacle, once they were common, now put into uncommon use, God's use, are no longer permitted to go back out without being destroyed. There is a type in that, you know. 1 Kings 19.19 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. You know, helps ministry. Poor guy, looks like he needs a coat. Here you go. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And the story, of course, for those who want to read it should, and for those who know it, no. <clears throat> The guy drops his, arc, his his plow and he chases after him and goes, Why are you giving me this? <laughs> no. And Elijah goes, It's done. you you got to realize, ordinary farmer now, but going to the school of the prophets, you know, learning, expecting to be a minister someday, maybe. All of a sudden, I mean, what would you do if all of a sudden somebody walked up to you while you were working at your job and said, you know, God's asking me to retire. It's time for me to go home to the Lord. I'll be leaving in about two years. You're now Billy Graham. Have a nice day. <laughs> That's about what he did. You are now Billy Graham. Have a nice day. You are now Papa Hagen Jr. Take over. You are now the next descendant of the mantle. The covering has been handed off. When the priest was due to leave his office by death, he had to hand it over. Some of us have been trained under the best. Some of us have been trained under the worst. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, the truth is the matter. And if it's been passed on to you, maybe there's going to be a responsibility you'll pick up one day. I was thinking the other day about somebody who spoke over me one time and said, you're supposed to be doing this. And then I found out that, that somebody is very sick right now. And I thought, oh, no. It hit my stomach that way. Oh, no. I wonder how many people he said that to. Because <laughs> when it's time for that minister to pass on, and if God has said, tell that one he's like you, what are you going to do? Well, we'll see. We'll see if that was the Lord or not. <laughs> We'll see whether or not little David over there is really going to be king in Israel one day just because some dude with a mantle and a flask of oil decided to cover the kid. We'll see. We'll see whether this carpenter's son's ever going to amount to anything. 
We'll see whether my son becomes what I think he's going to become. I think I'll just tuck this away in my heart for now. We'll see. We might have got it wrong. Who knows? <laughs> if it is, it is. And we is. It's 2 Kings 2.8. Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither so that they went over on dry ground. Hmm. Mighty powerful mantle. And Moses took a staff and lifted it up and departed the waters. Hmm, mighty powerful staff. And what else do we wear of the Lord? What if God says, and here's what I want you to do, son of man, command. Turn to these mountains, Ezekiel, and command that they shall come down. Ooh, ouch, ouch, ouch. Jeremiah, I want you to no longer command for these people. Don't pray for them anyway. Ouch, ouch, ouch. I have something. It is called an anointing. What happens if I apply it to the river of life? <laughs> what happens if I apply it? Second Kings 2.13 He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. That was when Elijah was leaving. Just keep your eye on me and you can have my mantle. We already gave it to him once. <laughs> we've given it to him permanently now. First time was just to let him know, you're called. Last time was to let him know, you keep following me, you're going to get chosen. You keep your eye on the mantle and you're going to be faithful. But Elisha still had to go back to that river with that mantle and prove it wasn't a coat. He had to prove that it was the linen garment. He had to prove it was the sanctified object that God said, you touch it, you die. He had to prove that it was the Ark of the Covenant for him his contact point. Because when he went back across that river after Elijah was gone, he was Elijah. He had become who is like God. The covering and the man become one. The covering at first and the man at first are two. But when God covers something, it changes you forever. Excuse me. Next reference. Excuse me, I need to make one change here so I can do this easier. That's much better. Now I can see better. Second Kings 2.14 He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? He didn't say, Where is my God? Elijah's mantle, Where is the God of this? And when he also had smitten the waters, lo and behold, they parted. And Elisha went over. And that day was a new man, risen to walk in newness of life, filled with the anointing that he didn't have before. Sanctified, separated prophet, now filled with the Holy Ghost and power. There is a difference, depending on what you're wearing. Royalty. Royalty had their garments too, didn't they? Kings, prin princesses, <laughs> queens, princes. They have their own clothing. It's an interesting <coughs> reference in Esther. <coughs> it sounds so innocuous when you read it. You just go right by it. Until you take it in the context of what I'm talking about. Esther 5.1 now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now Esther is quite able to just walk up to him but not unless she's wearing a garment. It dawned on me that, yeah, you know, that's a really good point. We look at all the clothing things like, and they put on their robes. Yeah, but what happened when they put on their robes? What happens to King Saul if anybody touches him while he's still God's anointed for the kingdom? And what happens to King Saul when all of a sudden the Lord says the kingdom has now departed from you? There's a difference. 
When David wanted to king, kill King Saul while he was still the anointed king, and he cut his garment, he got a little bit of a correction. Don't touch mine anointeds. Don't do my prophets no harms. But on the other hand, once the kingdom has been removed, here, your servant can slay you with your own sword. No problem here. No repercussion to the servant for doing so. You get my point? If the salt has lost its flavor, what is it good for then? <clears throat> Except to be thrown on the ground and trampled under the foot of man. But as long as the salt has its flavor, you touch one of these, you touch me. You cut the king's coat and walk away with a piece of the prophet's garment, and you think you can just run a spear through the side of any preacher you want because you're appointed. Beware. It isn't always about the person. It's about the clothing. The principle is this. Take a little break from examples for a minute. Sort of. The principle is this. What you put on, you become. What you choose to put on in God, that God has set aside over here in his, in his closet, as it were, and he says, uh, would you like to put that on? Would you like to do this something or other? And you say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do that. A garment transfers. You didn't see it, but it happened. Because what God counts real in his mind is real, whether you see it or not. And the day you said, yes, Lord, I hereby surrender myself for, something transferred. Call it a piece of his spirit if you want. Call it an anointing if you want. Call it a calling if you want. Call it whatever you like. But you need to see it as a garment that is now very, very, very special. What you put on reflects your state of being, doesn't it? We do this even in the natural. What we put on, our clothing, matches our mood. Matches how we want to be looked at today. Matches how we want to be treated today. Helps us to blend in. You know, if I decided to go into a biker bar, you know, wearing a crisp tie and, and you know, fancy rings and, you know, bright shiny shoes, I'd be received, right? Because I'm just another human being like the rest of these wonderful human beings. Then why are all their heads turning? <laughs> I mean, I can go into any church I want, right? I'm just a Christian like every other Christian. You're just a Christian like every other Christian. We all just hang out together, right? We're just waiting for Christ to come, right? But beware the garment you wear when you walk in. They may not be used to seeing white light coming off the of face of Moses coming down from mountain. You know what I'm saying? When you're covered in something that makes you one step out of your humanity side, their response is to what they see. They might not even see you. They might see what you're wearing. Demons, for certain, can see things at times. And they go, oh, no! And they go, oh, oh! And they go, Arr. But when it comes out of the human being, it's just the human's response. Has thou come to torment us before our time, Jesus? Says the man in the synagogue. What are you talking about? I'm not here to torment Israel, you Israelite. What are you talking about? I haven't a clue what you're talking about. Do you think I came to judge? I didn't come to judge. No, he didn't even address that issue. He just went, you, out of there. <laughs> I know what you're covered with. Ugh. What you put on demonstrates who you are. And what God puts on you demonstrates who you are. What you put on communicates, whether you mean it to or not. <laughs> Clothing makes the man or the woman. <laughs> Deuteronomy 22.5. Ready? The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. 
For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord our God. Oh, sure, 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 right. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I see where this is going. Bigotry, hate crime. I see where it's all going. God says, you don't get it. You're creating confusion. And I don't want confusion. I want your garment to reflect what you are really. Well, I know what I are really. I know what I am inside. Really. Well, see, here's the problem. Okay? Everybody looking at you has determined what you are, too. And it ain't what's your insides. The way a person in Israel would determine whether or not this law had been broken would be what? Have a conversation with you to find out if deep down inside you're really the other way? No. They would go to your parents and say, How was this one born? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Why garments? Why the clothing? Why does it make such a big deal? Because the big deal is perfect image. Christ don't wear no woman's garment. And the church is not a man. You understand how I mean that? Beautiful garments. Isaiah 52, one. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and unclean. There's a time to put on your pretty garments. Because you're no longer under occupation. That's what he's talking about. Uncircumcised and unclean. You're going to have a day, says Isaiah, O Zion, you're not going to be under occupation anymore. You won't have to worry about determining an agreement between you and them. They don't get part of your city anymore. They don't get part of your land anymore. They don't get anything anymore. And when that day happens, you will put on your pretty garments instead of those fatigues you're wearing. And your cities will be decked with jewels instead of bomb holes. And your people will walk down the street in peace wearing good clothes instead of wearing brown and trying to blend into the walls so they're not seen. you got to see it. Look around the world. Pay attention to it. Camouflage. You hide by wearing the same thing. But if you're rich, you wear the bright things and everybody sees you. What you wear is commensurate to your freedom. It's commensurate to your Status. It's commensurate to how the Lord has blessed you at times. And I'm not just talking about coming to church wearing the best hat and the perfect tie and the shiny shoes and that that somehow represents how God blesses you. Because there are some people who come in with their widow's mites who are better clothed than you. However, having said all that, spiritually speaking, wear your best clothes. When you stand before God in prayer, wear your best clothes. Genesis 38:19 talks about a widow. It says she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. Changing your clothes shows a change of status. It shows a change of condition. It shows a change of who you are. I was a bride, a wife. Now I'm a widow. You know what I'm saying? We wear our jewelry the same way. I wear a wedding ring. You wear a wedding ring. But if one of us died today, would I still wear the wedding ring? Probably out of love, but not out of status. Not out of purpose. Not out of trying to tell anybody anything. Because as soon as they look and go, Oh, you're married! I'm going to have to reply, No, I'm not. I'm wearing the wrong clothing. You see what I'm saying? King Saul, when he was down to the bottom of the barrel, having lost his good friend Mantle, <laughs> lost his good friend Kingdom, watched his good people run away, get defeated by bad enemy, King Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, 1 Samuel 28, 8, 
and went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit. He even knew it was a familiar spirit. And bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. Let's go down to the local psychic, because we know they do get results. Mm -mm -mm, don't ever say they don't. And I want you to divine for me and go get the familiar spirit so I can have a talk with him. Because he's not talking to me right now. Well, yeah, you know, he's dead. But that isn't who wasn't talking. <laughs> that isn't who wasn't talking. Elisha could have come talk to him. The truth of the matter is, when your status changes, you change your clothes. You know, if you're Michael Jackson and you don't want to be recognized in public, you cover yourself with dark sunglasses. If you're Superman, you put the glasses on. I'm kidding. The example of the principle is this. When you put on a uniform, you become the uniform. A minute ago, you was not General Anthony J. You was Anthony J. Then the whistle blew. Then you jumped out of bed and jumped into your suit. And that suit has stars on it. And now all of a sudden when you walk down the street, whereas before they'd go, Hi, Anthony, how you doing? Now they go, Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What happened? Did I change? I changed, didn't I? I'm now something special because I wear a general's outfit. We watched a show the other night that was kind of humorous. One of the scenes in it was a guy was impersonating police officers to pull people over just to give them warning tickets. <laughs> I kind of had to laugh, you know. Yeah, there you have it right there. We put on our robes, our ministry robes, our whatever robes, and, <coughs> and some of us pretend and put out warning tickets. <laughs> but then there's others who really are cops, <laughs> and they really don't like impersonators. You know what I'm saying here? There's the real anointed priest, minister, king, prophet. And then there's the, I think I'm going to pretend to be a priest, minister, king, prophet and put me on a cloak. And the people will recognize them as police until it's time for them to do something that's not police. <laughs> yeah, we can all fake the anointing, the holy tones, the humility, but when it comes time to lay hands on somebody for real, can we summon God? When we step inside our tabernacle and we put on the cloud, you know, what happens? That's what this is about. That's what the powerless messages are really about. That's what all of this is about. It's about, what are you wearing? When you put on a six-shooter and a badge, what do you become? You become sheriff. Sheriff. One on each hip. You get to walk down through your local west town and everybody goes, Good morning, Sheriff. How you doing, Sheriff? Good to see you, Sheriff. But yesterday, when he wasn't wearing the guns and the badge, before he got anointed and appointed to office, he was just George W. Bush. <laughs> now he's Air Force One. <laughs> now he's Cavalcade Car One or whatever. <laughs> Breaker, breaker, this eagle, eagle has landed. Cloaked in a symbol. Don't touch the symbol. <laughs> when a woman or a girl puts on a wedding dress, she becomes a bride. What you put on, you become. If your name is Bruce Wayne, and you put on a black outfit, <laughs> and fight evil, you're not Bruce Wayne. You became something else. You are something else. The terror that's stricken into the hearts of men is something else. When Jesus Christ walked up on the scene, looks like an ordinary Israelite walking up. There was nothing about him that was assuming or evident to be that he should be the Son of God walking on planet Earth. Until he walks up into the synagogue and he looks in the eyes of that man. And until he walks up to the Gadarene and looks in the eyes of that man. Until he walks up to the Pharisee and looks in the eyes of that man. 
And then all of a sudden, something's not right. Something's changed. Looks the same. Looks like a guy. Wears the guy robes we wear, you know? Then why do we feel like he's clothed with something else? How is it he has authority to do things like that? What is he? Some say he's a prophet. Some say he's a this. Some say he's a that. I don't know. Clark Kent or Superman? What is he? We don't even know what he is. What manner of man stops storms? That's what they said. What manner of man stops storms? Have you ever seen a guy do that? No, I never saw a guy do that one. But we have heard of rivers parting and lakes parting and <laughs> Red Sea parting, so we should have gotten smart on that one real quick. I mean, if you can move water, can't you walk on water? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the logic wasn't quick enough to catch up to a little bit of go study your Old Testament and pay attention to what your New Testament prophet's now doing. The truth of the matter is, a human being, the son of Joseph, born of Mary, under the law. Watch out, he's wearing something else. It hit me, he's wearing something else. All those fancy verses in there, he's wearing something else. But I'll get to that in a minute more. Mourning and grief are seen in the clothing. We wear black when we go to a funeral, when somebody dies. In the Old Testament, Exodus 33, 4, it says, When the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments, left the jewelry off as a sign of mourning. Because putting your jewelry on is a sign of blessing and happiness. Don't, excuse me, not anointing yourself means something in the Old Testament. Anointings for different reasons occurred. People could do it for themselves, you know. Second Samuel 14.2 Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself, thyself to be a mourner. Feign thyself to be a mourner. I want you to fake being a mourner. And here's how you do it. Put on now mourning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. How do we fake people out? We put on a different set of clothing. How does the devil fake us out? <clears throat> Think. Becomes angels of light. Puts on a different set of clothing. Disguises himself as your friend. Disguises himself with the cloak of your own voice. Make sure that he covers his snarly, ugly nah, voice with the soft, smooth, comforting voice of God so that he can make himself look like God. Go to the sides of the north and fake you out. He changes his appearance. What is your appearance? Your appearance is what you're wearing. It is not what you are. We have to understand this issue of appearance. We have to understand the spiritual ramifications of the change of how something looks. So when you're a mourner, you're going to be wearing one kind of clothing. When you're a worshiper, you're going to wear another kind of clothing. I'm talking spiritually here. Understand me. When you're a son coming before the king, you're going to be wearing a different set of clothing. When you're the music ministry of David in the temple, I mean, uh, Solomon in the temple of Solomon, you're wearing a different set of clothing. You are what you are. I'll never forget one sister who said something one time in public. She said, everybody comes up to me, as close as I can quote it, everybody comes up to me, and they always try to talk to me like I'm the person that does this prophecy. They don't realize that's God. That's not me. The real me is this. That's what I am when God's on me. They always want to talk to me like I'm always that. I'm not always that. I'm only that when God wants me to be that. How many times do people walk up to you and say, well, you're a theologian. You should have the answer to this. Oh, yeah, I know every answer in the universe. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, you're the one who... I, I watched you. You prayed for that guy. He got healed. You're the healing man. You're the healing lady. I get to come to you. 
And that's not me. And I don't have that robe on right now. But if you come back tomorrow, I'll ask the Lord tonight and see. I'll be like Balaam at least on your behalf. I will go up and see if the Lord perchance will answer that request. But first I got to get me my garments on. And then I got to get me up to the mountain. And then I got to get me up to the throne. And then I got to get me up on the throne. And then I got to have a talk. And then I got to see what he hands me on the way out the door. Yeah, there's something in this. There's something spiritual in this to be aware of what you're wearing. What are you wearing today? Are you wearing ashes and dust? And then trying to minister the gospel? Are you renting your clothing in mourning? Esther 4.1 Mordecai perceived all that was done. Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter voice. Job 2.12 when they lifted up their eyes afar and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. They rent every man his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. Jonah 3, five. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Oh, now that's interesting, isn't it? The two examples I read is of somebody in grief ripping their clothes. I don't even look whole anymore. You've torn my heart out. In the case of Nineveh, it was, oh no, we blew it. Oh no, 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 no. Proclaim a fast. Put on sackcloth. Sackcloth. I don't know what the real Hebrew word is there, but I always picture these guys in sackcloth. <laughs> and it seems appropriate to me. You know what I mean? It's like, they're wearing robes, man. They're wearing gold and jewelry, and they're just happy in their sin. And then along comes a prophet and says, Forty days thou art destroyed. And the first thing they think of is, Whoops, wrong clothing. <laughs> wrong clothing. I can't, I can't keep pretending like it's okay. It's not okay anymore. Yesterday it was okay. Today it's not okay. I'm convicted. Today I changed. Today the Holy Ghost came and went tick, tick, tick on my nose. And I have to change my clothes now. Sorry. Uh, sackcloth. Do you know what happened to Christ? Have you ever thought about this? What happened to Christ just prior to his crucifixion? They changed his clothing. They took away from him that wonderful robe. You know, the one they cast lots over? And they replaced it, didn't they? It says they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. They mocked him with a king's robe. Here's your purple, and here's your crown, and here's your servants, and here's who we are. And even across the cross, on the top of the cross, what did they do? King of the Jews. And somebody said, no, take that down. Say he said he's king of the Jews. And the reply was, let it be. That marker we're leaving up there. Don't know why, really. Wonder if an angel didn't speak out of their mouth. Leave it up there. <laughs> but Christ, can you imagine that? John nineteen two. The soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. So, King of the Jews, a eh? here, wear this. Humil humiliation. He'd been whipped. He'd had his beard plucked. And then they give him a change of clothing to represent you're not who you think you are. You're nobody. You're nothing. We're going to cart you away like a common criminal. We're going to hang you out in front of the public for everybody to see that you're naked. Naked. They would be naked. You're just nothing. The change of clothing on Christ was to show that he wasn't something. But you see, they had never seen the thing he was, which is what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. When all of a sudden he was transfigured in front of his disciples, and they saw what? Light. First John says, we beheld him and touched him, and oh my goodness. <laughs> they saw Christ clothed when they saw a transformation. 
And then when the transfer, excuse me, transfiguration, and when the transfiguration was over, he was back to being just meek, mild-mannered son of carpenter. Up on the cross, he didn't look like no powerhouse. Come, heal thyself. Come down, O great physician. Sorry, I'm not wearing that clothing right now. I'm wearing the I gotta die for the world clothing. And this is what people who die for the world wear. We wear blood. We wear thorns. We wear dripping signs. We wear piercings in our hands. This is what I'm wearing now. I'm wearing a cross. And you will forever remember that I wore it too. But one day, I'm going to put back on my robe. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I have not gone to the Father yet. Don't touch me. That's what he said when the woman came up to him at the grave. Don't touch me. She thought he was a gardener. Clothing didn't look right until she looked at him a little closer and said, Wait a second, you're not the gardener. You're him. <gasps> nope, don't touch me. Not yet. Why did he do that? It's one of those big mysteries. Why did he do that? Don't touch the garment, boys. You can't handle the power. You can't handle the power yet. But when I ascend, I will send you that garment. I will let that mantle fall from the sky. I will give it to you, but not just yet. Fifty more days. Get thee up to a room. Get thee waiting. I told you it would happen. And I do everything predicated on what the Old Testament saints showed you. I'm written in the volume of the book. Go look at it. I'm the priest. I'm the prophet. I'm the greater than David and the greater than Solomon. I'm the king. Go look at it. Now go look at the shadow. Now go look at the substance. They wore it. I am it. I wear it. You am it. The soldier wears his garment. But until he puts it on, he's not the soldier. Adam and Eve were innocent in the garden. Innocent. And then one day they weren't innocent. And the first thing they change is their garment. Mm -hmm. And God looks at them and says, wrong garment. <laughs> Uh, I don't want you having that image forever. I, could you imagine what planet Earth would have been like with fig leaves everywhere? Fig leaves in blue, fig leaves in red, fig leaves... You know, anyway, kidding a little bit. <laughs> the soldier wears his garment. The armor. We always talk about the armor. The armor. The armor. Wait a second. Now we got to talk about the armor. See, the armor is just clothing. We're always discussing the practicality of the armor. The practicality of the shield. The practicality of the buckler and the so forth. There's practicality of the helmet. But wait a minute. What about the fact of what it did to you when you put it on? What about the fact that the moment you put that armor on, your enemy goes, enemy, enemy alert, enemy. If you're walking through a street in a war zone, and you're wearing the drab brown clothing of the dirt that you're walking on tied to the buildings you're looking at. All those guys with machine guns, they don't even notice you. If you're just average Joe Christian walking about in this muddy world where the war zone is, and you're wearing average clothes that blend in, there's nothing to worry about. But if you decide to strap on something, <laughs> call it a bomb, Call it a machine gun. Call it fatigues. Call it whatever you want. And then you go down that very same street. They're still going to ignore you, right? <laughs> the only difference between the innocent dying in a war and the military dying in the war is the military know it's coming. And the innocent never see it coming. The clothing makes the warrior. 2 Kings 3.21 says, When all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, kings plural, they gathered all that were able to put on armor, and upward, come back, and stood in the border. They went after all who were able to put on armor. Are you able to put on armor? That is a question worth asking, you know. <coughs> Isaiah 59:17 For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing 
and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Uh-oh. The zeal of my father's house has eaten me up. That's the cloak. And the day of the vengeance of our God. Uh-oh. That's coming. You know, he hath anointed me to do this, 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 and what? Usher in the day of? Uh-huh. The garments of vengeance. Book of Revelation. What do you see? What are they wearing over there anyway in the book of Revelation? Oh, you know, white armor and, uh, you know, just clothing. It doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> No, every imagery of clothing in Scripture has always meant something. Jesus, in the beginning of the book of Revelation, is seen with feet of brass. Interesting boots, Jesus. <laughs> Isaiah 59, 17. For he has put on righteousness as a breastplate. There it is. Moving on. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Well, okay. Let's cast off the works of darkness. Let's deny the flesh. Let's forsake all and follow him. Let's uh, make sure that we follow Galatians 5 and don't do any of the works of the flesh. That's all good, right? That's all we need to do, right? Just make sure we obey the law and make sure we don't disobey the law and stop right there. Because that's all we got to do is just get our act together. And let us put on the armor of light. Two-part two part answer. Yes, wash thyself. And then you can put on the garment of the priest. Yes, you can put on the mantle too if you want. Yes, you too can be a king. And yes, you have to put on the armor of light. You have to know how to stand up and be anointed. You have to know. You have to work at that. That's not an easy do. It says in Corinthians that the gifts are dispersed as God wills. But have you ever asked yourself the question, by what criteria does he will it? I've often wondered. Do we ever even ask him? Lord, there's nine gifts here, and it says you dispense them according to every man according to your purposes. But what do I have to be on the receiving end in order to receive my purposes? Because I guarantee you, when he walks up to you and says, <clears throat> uh, you're a such and such, and he gives you a title, uh, the garment is what he's handing you. How many of us run away from our callings because the garment's going to feel a little tight? Yeah. We, we know what it means. We know what's going to happen to us when we put it on. We know that if we step into that anointing that he appointed and then we start feeling it dripping down off our head and coming down on our shoulders, you know, oh no, God's here. Oh no, God's here. Oh boy, God's here. I was listening to a song the other day that my wife was playing and it's a country song with a gospel message in it. And, and, and deep inside my stomach it started. And she, she was saying, you got to hear the song. It's a really cool song. No, this was a really painful song. No, this was a really great song. No, this was a really hard song. No, this was a really convicting song. No, this was really a... Because what happened was I got anointed. <laughs> but instead of coming down from the top down, no, 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 no. This one starts in the middle. And it starts swirling. And then all of a sudden the electricity moves out through my body and it goes out through my fingers and I'm feeling it out going through my toes and it's expanding and I feel like I'm going to just blow apart into a billion pieces. And we're only out of the first chorus. <laughs> we're only headed into the beginning of the chorus. And I'm already like... <sighs> because when you start feeling that cloak of anointing, you start feeling like some people do heat in their hands. What's the heat? What's the goosebumps really all about? Come on, explain it to me. Is that God? No, just the garment. <laughs> That's what it is. It's just the garment. Mm -hmm. It's just the presence. It's just Him uh, trying to communicate to you that He is present, ready for duty. Mm -hmm. Are you? Amen. <laughs> all of a sudden, a whole lot of things make sense. Did Christ speak as God or as man here? Well, what was he wearing? 
Was he the man or the prophet? Well, what was he wearing? <laughs> and what about John the Baptist anyway? Well, what was he wearing? <laughs> Put on the armor of light. Why? Why do we need to wear an armor of light? Why? Why? <laughs> we wear an armor of light because we have to fight something that's very dark. Uh oh. Come here. Thank you. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hmm. Do you realize how strangely anachronistic that sentence is? The armor's going to help me to stand against the wiles of the devil? That tells me that the armor is gifted with a yumum and thumum. Having the word of knowledge discerning the spirits and prophecy certainly would make me a much better warrior than I am right now. Yeah, amen. If I put on the whole armor of God, uh, by the way, that's a lot more than Ephesians 6.11. Go read the other verses about armor. <laughs> we always only look at this one. There are other ones. Put on all the armor of God, like the entire armory. <laughs> put that on. I was watching the movie Ultraviolet. Okay, it was not a great movie, but there was a concept in there that I really liked. Interdimensional storage space for your weaponry. Yeah, that's cool. Bottom line for those who haven't seen the movie is a, guy, a gal goes to a guy who's an arms dealer, and because they have the ability to store things in interdimensional space, she just takes her arm and puts it up to the device that allows for the transfer of weaponry. So that later, when she's in the fight and she needs a new Uzi, two pop just pop right out of her hands. And when those bullets are gone, she throws those away and two pop out of her hands. And when those bullets are gone, she throws them away and two pop out of her hands. The funniest scene in the whole movie, she walks up to this building where the security guard is and he says, Are you carrying any concealed weapons? Then the scanner looks at her and he goes, Something to the effect of, oh, crud. <laughs> yes, we are carrying concealed weapons. And let's admit it. Let's quit trying to pretend that we're just meek, mild-mannered Christian attending local religious ceremony. Let's quit trying to pretend that we're wearing brown robes of ordinariness while we're walking around going through the demonic scanners going, bing, 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 bing. You wonder why the devil knows where you are? The weaponry's giving you away. <laughs> you tried to board the plane of a demonic flight, <laughs> and the bells went off. <laughs> and they say to you, please deposit your gifts right here. And you say, no. not over my dead body. <laughs> and please take off that, clo that cloak. It's having a little bit of a problem with our sensors. I'm sorry, but I can't take that mantle off. But if you don't, we won't let you in here. Well, then your church has got a problem. Your guards are protecting you from the light. You can have miscalibration of those equipments, you know. When we decide to put on righteousness, we put on righteousness. Even Job knew that. 29.14 I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was a robe and a diadem. Ooh, <laughs> that's a powerful statement. And we have put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's created by God. Never forget, God gave the blueprints for the clothing. God gave the blueprints for the tabernacle. God gave the blueprints for everything that went in the tabernacle. And God gave the blueprints to determine how you're going to operate in the spirit. Mm. End of story, temple. I don't know if I want to be a temple today. Sorry, temple. I don't know why people just walk up to me and tell me all their troubles. <laughs> I don't know, was it the shingle on your back that said... Hi, I'm a friend of God. <laughs> they saw it invisibly. You didn't. <laughs> yeah. We are going to learn a little bit faster on this one. And so it is. When we put on Christ, when we put on our covering, when we say we are baptized into Christ, what do we put on? 
Oh, it's just a nice a little figure of speech that means I'm a Christian. Galatians 3.27, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? So when the devil looks at you, what does he see? Uh-oh. Christ. He might poke and prod you just to make sure. If thou be the cloak of Christ. Here, let me prick you a couple of times, see if you bleed. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? There's something very powerful, very revelatory, very strong on understanding how you're covered. Understanding who designed the clothing for you. Who designed the armor for you. And the fact that he said, this is the blueprint and this is how I want it cut and this is how I want it looking and this is the color I want it to be and this is how you wear it and this is when you don't wear it and this is when you do wear it, tells you he's 100% behind it. Because he exacts extreme penalties for those who try to uh, steal it, misuse it, fake it. Don't say the Lord has said, book of Jeremiah, there are those who speak out of their own hearts. They say, I'm a prophet too, thus saith the Lord. But they spoke out of their own hearts because I didn't give them a garment. <laughs> and what about that poor fella in the wedding feast who came in without his, whoops, garment? Remember that? It was the garment that got him thrown out. Oh, the lack thereof. No garment, no enter. The virgins could have got in the gate, those five foolish virgins. They did have the right clothing. They neglected something else. Well, we're all, we're all washed in the blood of Christ. We all wear white robes. We all are going in the gate. Oh, I wish that were true. Some of you are going to go in one gate, and some of you are going to go in another, and yes, you're probably going to end up in heaven, but some of you are not going to get to go to some parts of it. And I only pray, I only pray, that I'm not speaking to myself when I say that. Because <laughs> I really don't want to be among the five dum-dums. <laughs> I don't want to say, look at me, I'm clothed in white, look at me, look at my prayers, at least I'm not like that man over there. And here's my offering, 10,000 shillings, bing, 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 all in the bowl. Now, I think I'd rather be the guy that slips it under the carpet here and drops it in the middle of that. I'd rather be the guy that, well, like I've said before, watch out for the quiet prophets. I don't know what God's going to do with us, but he's certainly telling us the truth. We are going to make sure, body of Christ, that we follow these truths. Colossians 3.10 and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. You're going to look just like him. Uh, okay, trick question. Ten priests in a row, what do they look like? What? Well, same priest. Because <laughs> they got a hood over their head that they're not allowed to take off. They're all dressed in white. They weren't allowed to show their ankles even when they went up on the altar. They had to make sure the robe went all the way to the ground so no flesh was seen when they were up there. And they all stood in a row and did their thing. Yeah, they were unique. <laughs> Get my drift on that? It's great to be anointed. But sometimes it makes you just look like everybody else was anointed. You don't get treated any more special. I'm the prophet! Yeah, you and ten others, bud. Now, what's the message? That's the correct response. Not, oh, it's prophets. Oh, it's the apostles have come to town. Greatest teacher on planet Earth! <sighs> you all have an anointing. But don't touch the carpet. Don't touch the cloth. Men of the cloth. Yeah, there's a reason they're called that. Wear your collar backwards and everybody treats you different. Put your armor on and the demons do the same. Not likely. They will treat you different. Colossians 3.12 Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Catch that put on phrase. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. 
Oh boy, so I'm wearing a robe of white, now I gotta decorate it with mercy, and I gotta cover it with long suffering, when really what I wanna do is smack you in the nose for yelling at me! Oh, I'm wearing this clothing, see? <clears throat> I'll tell you a funny, you'll laugh, I hope. There is an advantage to putting Christian bumper stickers on your vehicle. There is an advantage. It will deter you from going places you shouldn't. If you have any respect to the name of Christ. When a person says, here's who I am, they make decisions. Then they show their decisions. When you're King Saul and you want to go to the witch indoor, you don't walk around wearing your king's robes, do you? When you're a CIA agent, you don't stand up and go, hi, I'm a CIA agent. <laughs> you change your robes. Hi, I'm just an ordinary citizen. But I'm watching you. What I'm trying to say here is, go ahead, put on Christ. Why not smile? They know you're a Christian anyway. They're just checking to see whether you're happy. <laughs> they just want to see what your clothing is today, that's all. They just read your bumper sticker last week, you know. They saw, they saw your uh, decal. It's so funny. I used to be so against bumper stickers and things of that kind because I used to say, can you imagine Jesus Christ walking around with a bumper sticker on his donkey? And yet, okay, there's some advantage to having a bumper sticker on your donkey. <laughs> of course, I don't think his would have said, you know, uh, I am him. <laughs> you know, we always think, you, deserve it. Anyway, you get my point. A bumper sticker is a piece of clothing. It's a jewelry. It's a way of showing yourself. But, the truth of the matter is, no bumper sticker is worth anything if deep down inside you aren't covered with the same cloak. So God says, make sure you put on bowels of mercy. Show mercy to people. Kindness, humbleness, meekness, and long-suffering. Oh, we do hate that one. I'd like short-suffering, please. You get three offenses on me, and then I'm going to... The disciples, how often do we forgive them, Lord? I don't know. What kind of clothing are you wearing? Carnal clothing? Or my clothing? My clothing's going to say long suffering on it. You know, and it was written on his breastplate, long suffering. <laughs> Colossians 3.14, above all these things, put on charity. Put on charity. Put it on. I don't feel very loving today, okay? Yeah, but, you know, running around with naked unlove isn't very pretty. I serve Jesus Christ, but I don't feel any love. I think there's a reason why God says put it on. It, it's, it's striking me. It's been striking me all morning while working on the sermon. You put it on because you'll eventually become what you put on. You know? You may not feel like what you are when you wear what you wear, but they will recognize it, and eventually you will recognize it because you put it on. We are to be conformed into the image of Christ, into the image of Christ. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to this world. Don't go picking up their image. But be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And this we're talking about spiritual internal. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As soon as you put on the right clothing and step into the right anointing and get in the right presence and go into the right closet, then you will know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a reason why God said he would anoint us. And he also said he will immerse us. And it struck me that the usage of the term immersion is just another different kind of covering image. John 1, five. John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. You will be immersed, hear this, immersed in the Holy Ghost. When a person's anointed, they pour oil on him and cover the body. God says, I'm going to just plain plunk you in the water. You're going to be surrounded. You're going to become a spiritual fish. 
You don't need to walk on dry land anymore. I'm going to give you an environment. That's what this is. It's an environment. An environment you didn't have before. You had me walking with you, but I'm now, now I'll be in you. You had the presence come and go, but now you're going to be in the presence wherever you go. That's a big difference. That's having been handed a robe, if you accept it. You have to accept it. If you don't accept it, you don't get to be it. That's the way God sets everything up in his book. It's the way he set up everything from day one. I will offer it to you. You will decide if you accept it. Moses was offered the chance to go deliver Israel all by himself. He got a little bit of cold feet. And Aaron got part of it. Jeremiah was offered. And he got scared of faces. God didn't give him a backup plan. He became a single point of dungeon activity. <laughs> he was not allowed to fear their faces. God said, you fear their faces and I'm after you. Oh, man, you just hate it when Dad says, I don't care what that bully did at school. If I find out again that he beat you up, you're going to deal with me. It changes how the son will go fight that next fight. <laughs> I know more than one boy who had that happen. All of a sudden, they're very skilled fighters. Yes, they are. Because when you realize what you're being faced with, you make choices. We are baptized in the Holy Ghost because we ask to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Go look at the text. You must ask for it. Acts 10.38 says this, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He put it upon him. He says to Christ in the New Testament, he says, as I have life in myself, I'm going to give you power to have life in yourself. That's what you call anointed, all right. Instead of one gift, he gets everything. He becomes the perfect express image of God because he's wearing God. You know, when you put on your headphones and you wear them and they're plugged into something that's playing, you hear what it's playing. When you take off them your headphones and you lay them on the counter and the thing is playing, you don't hear what's playing. Is that really a hard concept for us Christians to get? Put on. Put on. Put on. Please. Cover thyself. Thou art naked. <laughs> the Church of Jesus Christ right now is being pulverized because it's naked. It's being assaulted because it's powerless. And those who have found some pieces of it are doing much better, but they're still having a tough fight because we are one body. And as one body, we, plural, put on Christ. But not all of us are wearing the robes. Not all of us are taking on the anointing. Not all of us are doing our tasks. We're still standing outside going, put on the robe, don't put on the robe. Put on the robe, don't put on the robe. Wear the armor, don't wear the armor. Do I have a scepter in my hand or not? Second mm. Corinthians one twenty one. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. He who has anointed us is God. And should it be any any surprise then that if Elohim is upon us, we become Elohim? Is it any surprise that when Elohim decides to be the mighty one that we become the mighty ones and the rest of the time we're just meek, mild, mannered, going to work average Joes Revelation 12 1 says this and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun what's that image supposed to mean isn't that just symbolism If I were clothed with the sun, literally, that's an awful lot of heat I can put out. If I were clothed with the sun, literally, that's an awful lot of light I'm shining on you. In other words, life or death to you if I'm clothed in the sun. If I'm wearing the sun, what happens if I take my sun off? Does your universe go into darkness? 
The woman, the, cl the church, does not realize it, but she is clothed. And she is clothed with many garments and much jewelry. Some of it is for the adversary. Some of it is for the unsaved. Some of it is just because of what you are now. Revelation 7.14 these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the blood of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, when it was, t when it was uh, Passover, what did God say to do? He said, take blood, put it on the doorpost, put it on the trestle below, make sure you have lamb's blood on your door, and when the death angels come by, they will look at that door and go, <clears throat> not us to touch. The angel Lord will go in front of them and say, not permitted to touch. Because that house is clothed. It's covered. The blood of Jesus Christ is as a garment unto you. The blood of Jesus Christ is sprinkled along the way up to the throne so when you walk on that, your feet are protected. You can approach unto God perfectly safe because your path is covered. It's safe. It isn't going to rise up to bite you with thorns. When you decide that you're going to be washed by the blood of the Lamb and washed by the water of the Word and put on Christ, you put on God. You put on everything God offered. Christ is the perfect image of God. In the Old Testament, in the heathen religions even, to this day, one man taketh a piece of wood, and he standeth it up, and he covers it in gold. Why? That he might say, this is his God. A piece of wood covered in a metal makes it a God. No. No. The piece of wood covered with the metal that symbolizes something now becomes a God. And you might be wood. You might be. But if you're covered in God, you are representing Him. When you understand and you see this picture through old world eyes, I now get it. Maybe I don't get it enough because i got a whole section I need to think about about Christ Himself and about the relationship with Christ, the Father, and the image, and all that. But when I stop to think about it, I keep thinking about the fact that here we have a man that when everybody looked at him said, My Lord and my God. And we've been wrestling for 2,000 years exactly how does those theological extracts multiply themselves out. Into, and it's really not that hard. It's really not that hard. At, the ba at basic level, this message is not that hard. There once was a carpenter, born of a virgin, birthed by the Holy Ghost. One passage says the Father, one passage says the Holy Ghost. You get the picture. But it wasn't until baptism he said out loud, This is my beloved Son, I am well pleased. And from that moment on, he went off into the wilderness, and he got tempted, and the devil said, If thou be the Son of God... He must have been listening over there at the baptism. What do you think? Yeah, I think. And then he comes out of his temptation, and bam, he is what he is. Until he ain't three and a half years later. And then he is for the rest of existence. No wonder they got so mad when... Peter, is it? No, not Peter. <coughs> Stephen, when he was being stoned, said, I beheld him sitting on the right hand of God. <laughs> what do you mean he sits on the throne? That means he's wearing royal robes, too. Oops. Oops. didn't say he was near the throne, by the throne, looking at God on the throne. He said he was sitting on the throne. I guarantee you, it was not a naked man sitting on the throne. It was a clothed man sitting on the throne. And that light cannot be stopped. That light will forever go forward. When we stop to realize that we have something that the world does not have, a wardrobe. <laughs> What's it say in the book of Revelation? You know not that you are naked and blind. 
Revelation 3. I encourage you to go get some clothes. And while you're at it, get some eyes to have too. You're really ugly looking. Beautify thyself a little bit, would you? You're not seeing too good either. Matter of fact, <laughs> it's really a severe chastisement against the church of Laodicea to say that. You think you're all in good shape, but you're not going to make it in the feast wearing that. God has made his point very, 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 very clear from Old Testament all the way through New. new. It never was really about you. It never really was about how perfect your Christianity is. How perfect your Old Testament walking was. It was about the sacrifice you put up, the blood. And when God looked down and he said, I really should judge you, the blood of Christ cried out of the ground saying, No, leave them alone, they're in me. That's the same prayer that Moses put up when God said, Let me come down and judge them. And Moses said, No, Lord, no, Lord. No, please don't. That's what Christ is doing as mediator. Where God had a cause, his son said, let's not. And the father's heart accepts the son's declaration. Just like the father, the almighty creator, accepted Moses' declaration. And all he's asking right now is, are you covered? And if you're covered by the blood, and if you're washed in the word... I can also give you some other things that you didn't know were available to you. Well, does that make you a first-class citizen and a second-class citizen and a third-class citizen? No. Does the fact that one day I wear a blue shirt and the next day I wear a red shirt change my citizenship? The fact that one day I wear an, a uniform with three stars up here and the next day I wear a baseball cap and I go down to the ball game, does that change my citizenship? It's never been about citizenship. It's been about what are you wearing? Who are you? What are you manifesting? What's God using you in? What are you becoming? You become what you wear. Having accepted that as a premise, perhaps we'll put on more of what he offers us more quickly. And we'll understand when he says, Today I'd like you to switch your uniform. Today I'm putting you out in the field. I want you wearing fatigues. Tomorrow I'll put you in the par parade and you can wear the fancy clothes, okay? <laughs> Too many people want ministry for the fancy clothes so they can go down First Avenue, you know, trumpeting their Christianity. There are a lot of people in their fatigues. We don't even know where they're hiding in the bushes waiting to snipe or shoot something. And rightfully so. Rightfully so. We don't want to know where they are. Because if we knew where they were, then the demons that are listening in on our telephone lines and tapping our church services and hanging out trying to collect, you know, surveillance and stuff, would turn around and go after them. So God very wisely says, get thee in thy closet. We'll talk privately. Come into my bunker. We've got some work to do. And the enemy doesn't always get to see it coming. Thank God. <sighs> He's not omniscient. He's just got a lot of creatures running around really fast doing a lot of jabbering. Spies everywhere. Infiltrators! But they can't wear the clothes. They can't wear what you've got. There's going to come a day when this life will pass and you'll be giving a new body. And this corruptible will put on incorruption. Oh, I like that one. This tent, this tabernacle that we're in, this raggedy, breaking down tent, and you know it is, because the longer you, you know, when you get the tent the first day, it's really shiny, and the cloth is really shiny, and the steel beams that you hold it up with are really well. You know, but after about 20 years of going camping a lot, the beams are a little rusty, and, you know, the pegs that you put in at the ground don't sit quite right anymore, because the ropes have kind of worn out, and, yeah, we're in a tabernacle that's slowly proving that, uh, it was only designed for a few years usage and then you had to recall it. <laughs> but you're going to be putting on something else one more time when the time comes. You're going to put on incorruptible. This mortality must put on immortality. And all of a sudden I realized, you know, we always talk about how we're going to change, we're going to be a new body, we're going to... Oh, just, just think of it as putting on clothing. Just before you exit out, somebody's going to go, um, <clears throat> watch this. 
take the clothing you're wearing right there and leave it there on planet Earth, okay, would you? Because remember, the priest was ministering right at the beginning of the sermon. When he was done, he had to unfold his stuff, put it on the altar, put on his normal clothes and walk out. And I guarantee you we're going to do the same thing because when it's time to move from here to the next plateau, we're going to take this old flesh, we're going to fold it up neatly on a hospital bed or on the ground or in our favorite chair or our favorite table while we're eating breakfast. We're just going to look at it and we're going to go, I'm leaving it behind. Thank you. And we're going to go right out through that door. And God's going to go, here, put this on. Much better. Greater design. That was a good design. I did it good for that environment, but this one. This incorruptible is going to be a design you've never seen. And when you put that on, just like you learned about all those other things you're wearing, how they had purpose, not just pretty, this one's going to have purpose too. But boy, is it pretty. Boy, is it going to get to do things. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up. And all you see is the cloak of victory. Woohoo! <laughs> for now, our prayer is very simple. Lord, cover me. And he's going to say, this one or this one? He's a very good um, Alfred. He's a very good support. He's a very good helper. He's a very good lot of things. <laughs> but it's your choice to decide if you're going to uh, be in the biz. I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think there's a lot more to be understood in this concept pertaining to God in Christ that's worth meditating on. But for now, in yourself, the next time you go to pray, try being a visual person instead of a verbal one. Try standing before God and going, Just a minute, Lord. I repent of all my sins, Lord, and I just ask that you forgive me. Now I put the past behind me. I'm going to sit it right there. And I'm going to turn around and step up on the altar now. <clears throat> now, what do we got to get done? See if your heart doesn't discover a side of God you never saw before. See if you don't hear a voice you didn't hear before. See if something doesn't change because you did the type in your heart to put something else on. Jesus, we thank you for this message. Thank you for helping me to deliver this message. Thank you for the power of this message. We just ask, Lord, that you would show us more about this truth throughout the scriptures and help us to walk in that which you give us to wear. Amen.